I'm Ryan Grove, this is my wife Tiffany Grove, and thus far, these videos have contained me realizing that I'm no expert, just coming up with other people's ideas and maybe drawing some not so educated conclusions that I thought might be interesting, and my esteemed colleague, Tiffany, has been listing off um, facts <laughs> about things that have no that don't seem to be attached to any point so I thought I would try to tighten this one up a little bit and get down to business so I'm gonna get down to business uh, when we did the flat earth talks you are <laughs> you use Schrodinger's cat for an example of something I don't remember mm -hmm. but you didn't just mention Schrodinger's cat you actually drew an illustration mm -hmm. and showed it of a cat in a box. So, mm -hmm. in that same spirit, I have an illustration this time. And this illustration is about the pyramids of Giza. I'm not just speculating and spouting off crazy fantasies about why I think it was a power plant. I'm going to give a compelling little demonstration of how it possibly could have been used as a power plant. Now, the pyramid in Giza is missing the top, the capstone. And it is alleged that the capstone was made of solid gold, which is why it's not there anymore. In fact, so massive was it that it contained in, in contemporary terms perhaps billions of dollars worth of gold to make this capstone. And the, the uh, oh, I have notes too. Now, it's been told to us <clears throat> that the Great Pyramid was a, a tomb. And so the, the complex and intricate chambers inside have been given names like the King's Chamber, and the Queen's Chamber, etc. And there's some evidence in lore <clears throat> that suggests that this this abandoned piece of machinery was rediscovered later on after some sort of event that uh, destroyed the original builders of it and their civilization, and that it, once again, because it was such a grandiose structure, was repurposed for a tomb. And my ancient history, my ancient Egyptological history is about as sharp as, as my 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 expertise in any other area but what i think happened is that it was later just turned into a tomb just because they didn't know what it was for and they figured hey it must be a tomb so now we have the the capstone which is made of gold and i, I you know for all the grandioseness of other tombs and relics found in, in egypt i suppose you know that might be plausible. Well, I believe it's not the only tomb where the capstone is missing. I think that's why it got a little bit of steam, this well, whole I, idea. I just meant the amount of gold they would use for such a grandiose project, project. What I'm suggesting here is that there are no other tombs like it, like pyramids, that there were no other tomb capstones that you could draw reference from. In fact, that's no, one of the compelling... No, I'm a lot of the capstones were missing from... The well, the capstones are missing from all of the pyramids. Just like all the gold off of that one South American city was uh, removed from the facade. Yeah, kind of, of same that thing. Old city. Same thing happened it here at once in the past. You know the the eye on the the dollar bill, the pyramid on the back, the capstone with the eye. The ca that represents this golden capstone, and it's the all-seeing eye, and there's there's little details showing some sort of energy emanating from the capstone or light or something like that. So keep that in mind. Now, the, uh, the measurements and the angles and the shapes of the interior are far too complex <clears throat> and way too dissimilar to other burial tombs excavated throughout the whole region, which suggests that now we're beginning to suggest that maybe this wasn't a tomb. Maybe this was actually had some other purpose, like it was a machine. It does look like a machine. It's got highly specialized granite surfaces in some places, and they're all connected by complicated shafts. Now, the exterior 
at one time was covered in a thick layer of limestone. Uh, in fact, 150,000 casing stones that were highly polished, interlocking to an accuracy one hundredth of an inch. It looked pure white, brilliant. However, at this point, I want to add that in another source, and I got this source um, from a gentleman named Christopher Dunn, who wrote a book called The Giza Power Plant. Pretty cool. But other sources suggest that there are legends in regional uh, history that described the pyramid as looking like a mirror. And it was just covered in mirrors. And when you conjoin that notion with the notion that, you know, it's the desert area now, Giza, I mean, for the most part, sandy and all that stuff, there is also evidence that suggests at one time it was quite plush with rich fauna and vegetation. And, Very verdant. And I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but the, the implication was that there was some heat event which occurred at some other point in history that was so intense that it destroyed all the vegetation, most of it, and the fauna in the region, and it melted the stone covering the, uh, the outside of the pyramid, and it was turned to glass. And once it had turned to glass, or mirrors, uh, subsequently generations of local popu populations scavenged the, the facade off of it bit by bit until it was gone all the way. But anyway, let's continue with the machine hypothesis. Right, in ancient times, gold wasn't necessarily a money product. It honestly could have been used for decorative or functional purposes. Well, that may very well be true, but there is the fact that gold is one of the best conductors of electricity that you can yeah, find on the true. entire planet. That's true. And one of the best insulators of electricity is limestone and not just any limestone there's limestone that is referred to as uh, I can't find the name right now but the suggestion here is is that limestone was chosen for the casing stones oh it was a rare kind I don't have the name of it but it was a kind of rare limestone that does not contain magnesium because evidently magnesium magnesium reduces uh, the insulation properties of limestone. Right, because magnesium is a conductor, obviously. And so this particular rare kind of limestone did not have uh, mm -hmm. magnesium. Uh, Rhodes granite is a special granite stone used in the pyramid, and it was transported 500 miles downriver from Aswan. It contained silica oxide, a.k.a. quartz. Now, the lining of both the king's and the queen's chamber... You got the, let's see, the king's chamber right up here, and you got the queen's chamber right down here. They were both lined with this quartz, um, and it's almost pure quartz in those chambers. It's 85% quartz, which is pretty cool. Now, if you, now, here's the thing. If you squeeze quartz, static electricity is produced. If you squeeze quartz, static electricity is produced by compression and movement of the atomic lattices. And you know this how, because I remember when we had our Flat Earth Dialogues that I tried to uh, give some scientific evidence and you said that I could, did I test this myself? I know this how. So uh, you don't seem to use those same parameters. However, here. unlike you, I've established many times well, unlike me. that I'm not the educated well, expert well, and that uh, I once again said I was an expert so I'm bringing to you I'm, I'm just bringing and people clearly could see that I'm not that I'm I'm bringing to light and just as well trying to look at your things that I've been exposed to that have piqued my curiosity and that's all and hopefully and maybe to refute it through scientific endeavors <sighs> but you quote science as if it were um, useful uh, to you when you make these arguments yet you haven't done any of these experiments and you don't know anything about rock or metals or electricity. Nor do you history obviously. No, I know. By but the my litanies point is just of that random you're historical information. Out that I don't have anything I'm not I'm not backing that out at all. when I make a scientific argument, but now you do. No, that's, that's not fair. Let's take this up when we're not in the middle of explaining okay. this. All right. Okay. 
let's let's leave our emotions aside. I, I have no emotion about it. I'm just saying. Okay, so see if the, the when I say you squeeze quartz, it produces electricity. Uh, a modern day version of that same technology being harnessed is in the record player because with record players, usually the you know the arm has a a diamond or some sort of crystalline needle. And that needle gets bouncing in between the grooves of a record. And that bouncing creates electricity. And that electricity is amplified by the does amplifier. Does it create electricity or does it create sound waves? It creates static electricity, okay. which then the, the speaker okay. translates into sound waves. Okay. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now, uh, the insulation of the pyramid, the insulation that they made, would force any electricity that they may generate to find its way up to the gold capstone because it couldn't permeate the, the huge, tremendous limestone walls and, and that you know they built the pyramid out of and, and they had all the, the, the quartz lining and stuff. So the electricity was forced to follow its way up to the capstone. Now, what's awesome now, this is where it starts getting awesome, is that in the Queen's South shaft see you got the south shaft and you got the north shaft and they both lead into the queen's chamber well in the south shaft there have been traces of hydrochloric acid found on the walls and there have been traces of hydrated zinc chloride in the northern shaft and it just so happens when you mix these two chemicals together they suddenly create a tremendous amount of hydrogen gas and so if you, and, and the reason that these two chambers are separated with, from one another, but gradually lead to a meeting point is because of their volatility. So when they are deliberately in, and in a controlled way introduced to one another in the queen's chamber, um, all this hydrogen gas begins to be created. And it accumulates and then gets forced up through the grand gallery past 27 mechanical resonators and the the fixings or the the, the the places where these these resonators were fixed are the fixings are all still there the 27 of them and if we just found it and thought hey this would be a great place for some resonators as we try to harness electricity through gas that we're funneling through the chamber and we put them in those 27 places that it would work perfectly for uh, creating sound resonance and which would then create electricity that would be gathered up into the king's chamber the hydrogen would be so the electricity could then be harnessed and apparently this will be a part two because uh, I have to go into Tesla to figure out why, because apparently the author believes that when the electricity gets to the gold cap, that it is somehow shot up to the ionosphere, and the ionosphere actually holds and maintains that electricity and begins to spread it out over the, the entire ionosphere of the, the plane net. And uh, I think that that's pretty freaking awesome. Now, there's another guy named Dr. Brett Ikoa, and he said that he had a kind of a variation of this theory. He said there's not only um, the hydrochloric acid that was found in the Queen's Chamber in the hydrated zinc chloride in the northern shaft. He said in addition to that, he found sulfuric acid. And he also discovered traces of that in the, uh, in the, the King, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the north shaft, and in the south shaft, he found ammonium chloride and zinc chloride. Now, these reactions would essentially do the same thing. However, they would cause a tremendous amount of heat and uh, even explosions. And what is so neat, and so uh, the, the hypothesis is, is that according to how much of these resources were available at one, any particular time, that they would use a variety of these resources to generate the same kind of effect. And that what's interesting enough is that in the Grand Gallery, there's these black markings that 
are all over the walls and the ceiling, and it's traces of of materials being charred, which would and the the pyramid had to have been built so massively to withstand those kinds of explosions and withstand time, of course, too. Isn't that something else? And these reactions apparently would also create a lot of water. And so what did they do with the water? Well, it just so happens. They swam in it. They drank it. They rubbed it on their faces. <laughs> oh, Galen, like Galen Windsor. Windsor apparently. Well, it's, it's funny that they have this chamber underneath of the Queen's Chamber that leads well deep below the pyramid into a, these, these many, 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 many aquifers filled with water. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did with the runoff of the water. Now, I know that these have been discovered because other people that have discovered them said, oh, this is how they they made these huge underground um, water pools because water's flat, and they used that as the beginning level for building the pyramid with such precision. And now, the hypothesis further conjectures that other pyramids around the planet weren't massive generators like this one, that they were actually just the receivers that could draw electricity being produced right. in Giza yeah. from the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're in centers of all these civilizations around the, the whole planet, because the whole world at some point was using this technology. And I just want to reiterate that the author suggests that the exact same technology that Tesla designed, but was unable to actually complete. However, his experiments and things that uh, led up to his grand design, the sub-experiments were all successful, that um, that sort of technology uh, was already in use in ancient, 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 ancient Egypt. Pretty cool, huh? I mean, there's nothing that can't happen if you don't follow scientific thoughts. Yes, that's great. So that's, that is a more specific example of what I mean when I say, oh, the pyramids are ancient technology over and over and over again. And so I'm going to get a little deeper in, in each of these wild claims that I made and show you the information that I've been exposed to a little more deeply that turned my you know, that changed my mind about conventional history. So do you have something to add today? No, uh, actually, I just kind of wonder, like... No ad hominem. Is, what does it matter? This is ad hominem, isn't it? No, I, ju I just wonder what does it matter. Like, I almost have no interest in this topic at all. Because there's just so... Such minute information that I feel like we can never know. And you can spend a lot of time... I disagree. Conducting. I think there's a tremendous amount of information out there. But like um, Aldous Huxley said that... When, we, when a civilization gets to a certain point, it doesn't have to censor books or it doesn't have to brainwash people into thinking one way to keep them from thinking from another because all pertinent information is just drowned in a huge sea of irrelevant information. And I think that's the problem. I think that the information is abundant and that the trick is just trying to sieve the right nuggets out. Well, the huge sea of irrelevant information would just be that, regardless of these cultures existed or not, that they don't now and everyone died. And that they had Over. technologies yeah. greater than we give them credit for, mm -hmm. which then destroys the whole line of fabricated history given to us, so which then, which then, tech. which then declares the question, demands the, the question, why? Why are they lying to us? And I think that that question is a segue into current contemporary relevance. That there must be some reason for it. It must be important to the people that are trying to hide it. Well, I just feel like kings, kingdoms rise and fall and no one ever takes any note of any of them. And no one cares. So I, don't, I just don't find that it will ever really be relevant or useful. It's not, it's not about the individual kingdoms. Nor is it even necessarily about the technology. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to reiterate that it's about us being given a false narrative mm -hmm. for some reason. And the reason we've been given a false narrative. Now well, that is you what and I can is, agree is that we've been totally given a false important. narrative for sure. And it really gives credence to people like you who are just outlandish and out there and just making stuff up off the cuff. And credence to people who are seriously... Um, studying the issues and the science. This is one degree removed from ad hominem is what this is. This is what a clever oh, no, woman does. I'm just does. saying, though, that they've never gotten any farther than you have. 
Neither one of you have gotten any. Neither one of me? I thought my other me was totally right I'm on. I'm just saying the ones that are actually using their scientific knowledge and education to look into it versus a lay person who knows absolutely nothing about chemistry. You know what the difference between a farmer, just a primitive farmer, right, but and somebody, don't talk somebody who's, who's, who's teaching in a university about theoretical this and philosophical that, you know, either. information is good. And you, you get it. You get true I mean, information. I don't mind. You want to talk about it. I'm just saying I just don't find it relevant or useful or um, in any way how important or interesting. How truthful um, information is I feel like what's going on now is so important and interesting. And I just don't know why that matters at all. That's all. Well, I already explained why. So. Okay. Hmm. Uh, we're not getting divorced. Not yet. So everything's cool. We're going to make another video. But thanks for listening.